Was it? Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll leave it as it is. No problem. I hate that um, that's a rough one. Yeah, I got your message. Hey, break. You're going to get a price. Hey, see my man. So you all said you get excited? Thank you so much. Sure. Yes. Well, he said he's in uh, London today, here tomorrow. 
tomorrow in Moscow on Wednesday.
you when we're done with this.
somebody told me.
That's what it would be for. Okay, that's what this would be.
dad would make. Oh, all flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. standing up here. Yeah. The source of the crispy yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. And yeah, this is an 11. This is a 12.5. Yeah. 
A full house today. Nice to see you all. I assume it's only because you all miss me. I assume. There you go. All right. Uh, I do not have anything at the top. Julie, so we can go straight to your questions. Thanks, Josh. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the president on his swing through Asia was quite critical of his political opponents um, in terms of their criticism and his handling of the campaign against the Islamic State. Over the weekend, Leon Panetta, who obviously worked for the president, said that the resources being applied to the Islamic State mission have not been sufficient. Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat who's been quite supportive of the president, said something similar. What does the president make of the criticism coming from people who have either worked for him or been partners with him in Washington? Well, uh, Julie, I haven't uh, spoken to him about those specific comments that you've just cited. I, I think the one thing that, uh, I, get, I think there are two things, actually, that at least those two individuals are keenly aware of. Uh, the first is that both of them uh, are aware of how challenging this particular uh, problem is. Uh, when it comes to the situation in Syria, uh, for years, uh, this has been a, uh, a difficult problem to work through. Uh, and there's no denying how uh, significant uh, uh, that challenge has been as the United States uh, and our coalition partners have, uh, have worked through it. The second thing, and in some ways this is more important, uh, each of them, to a person, uh, is keenly aware of the priority that the president has placed on uh, working through this problem in a way that advances our national security interests. Uh, both of them have been involved in extended conversations with the president about the policy options that are available. Uh, and um, and you know, the president certainly has valued the advice that they have um, given over the years. And certainly if they have uh, additional ideas or suggestions uh, were you know, willing to take their call. Uh, but the fact is, the taking a look at uh, all of the resources that has gone into this uh, is uh, to understand that there is a comprehensive strategy that uh, is being implemented uh, by the United States and the 64 other members of our uh, coalition. And I think that is a testament to the priority that the President places on this issue. It's also a testament to the American leadership that's at work here. So does the president think that the resources he's devoted to this mission are sufficient? Well, the president certainly believes that there is more that our coalition partners can do to contribute to this well, effort. Not and coalition partners, the U.S. Well, again, I, I, it, it sounds that like you may have looked at their comments more closely than I did, but based on the way that you uh, presented them to me in the, your first question, the question is, are enough resources being dedicated to the mission? Uh, the success of this mission is dependent on 65 nations coming together, recognizing the common interests that they have here, uh, and dedicating significant resources. And we have seen stepped-up contributions uh, even over the course of the last week from members of that coalition, and we certainly welcome those stepped-up contributions. But are you saying that the U.S. resources are sufficient and it's additional resources needed from coalition partners that's the issue here? Well, uh, again, the, our, our point is that we have certainly been engaged in conversations, and the President was of, as he was traveling around the world uh, over the last week, having conversations with uh, leaders like President Erdogan, uh, you know, we met with our European leaders or our European allies uh, in Turkey as well. And those conversations centered on what those uh, members of our coalition can do to contribute uh, more resources. I certainly would rule out that there might be additional resources that are contributed by the United States. Uh, but when you consider the range of uh, elements to our strategy, it's, it's clear that the United States is making significant contributions. And whether that's the United States being the largest donor of humanitarian assistance uh, to the uh, significant problem of Syrian refugees, uh, or when you consider you know, the uh, significant investment of our military resources to apply pressure to ISIL leadership and to support uh, fighting forces on the ground as they uh, regain territory from ISIL. Um, I just want to ask quickly about the situation in Brussels. What does the president make about this, of the steps that uh, officials there have taken to essentially put this city on lockdown for several days as they look for suspects in the, in the Paris attacks? Does he believe that that is the right approach? Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly not going to uh, be in a situation where we're uh, Monday morning quarterbacking the, you know, the efforts that are underway in Brussels or anywhere, frankly, uh, to ensure the safety of, uh, uh, of the citizens of uh, of that European city. Uh, the, 
Obviously, the United States is committed to sharing information uh, and assisting with that investigation uh, as it is ongoing. Uh, but Have you been sharing information with the authorities in Belgium? Uh, absolutely. The, the United States, you know, since uh, has long-standing uh, uh, information sharing uh, agreements with uh, countries in Europe. This is actually an area where we do believe that there is more that our European partners can do uh, in terms of improving the quality and quantity of information that they share with one another, but also improving the uh, amount of information and the way that information is shared with the United States. Uh, but that is certainly something that we are committed to, uh, and um, you know, and we're we're committed to uh, helping uh, our allies in Europe uh, deal with this rather urgent threat. Okay, Julia. Thanks, Josh. Um, while the president was away, a number of Republicans applauded what they said was a delay of the president's plan to close Guantanamo, meaning the plan that he would be presenting to Congress. Um, does the White House? Do this as a delay, and is there any rethinking of plans to transfer Guantanamo prisoners to the United States in light of the refugee crisis that somehow, I'm sorry, not the refugee crisis, the rhetoric around Syrian refugees? Is there any kind of a rethink of perhaps this isn't the best time to also be bringing Guantanamo Bay prisoners into the United States? Uh, no. I, in fact, I think this actually is a situation where this is not the best time for the United States continuing to operate. Uh, a, a prison facility that we know uh, is a powerful recruiting tool that is used by extremists around the world. The President did talk about this in the news conference that he did uh, a couple of days ago. We know that ISIL's chief messaging goal uh, is to portray themselves as the true inheritors of or the true defenders of Islam uh, and to make aggressively the case that the Western world is at war with Islam. Uh, of course, those two narratives are false, uh, but doing something like continuing to operate the prison at Guantanamo Bay uh, only serves to, um, uh, you know, l advance the the narrative that uh, that I that ISIL is seeking to write, and um, you know that now is actually a good time for the uh, United States to take the long overdue step. Uh, of finally closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay. It doesn't serve our national security interests, if anything, it undermines them, uh, and is certainly not uh, an efficient uh, or effective use of, of taxpayer dollars when you consider the alternatives that are available, uh, which is to transfer uh, uh, to other countries those individuals that can be safely transferred um, and uh, uh, to otherwise dispense with those who can be prosecuted, uh, put them through our criminal justice system. Uh, and to safely detain those individuals who cannot be transferred. Uh, and there's no reason that, uh, uh, that, that, that we can't make progress uh, with that regard. So when should we expect to see that plan? Uh, I don't have an update for you in terms of the timing. But, Some, uh, sometime but, soon? I mean, you used to say soon. Is it still? Uh, that, that's still generally the time frame. But uh, at some point, that probably becomes inoperative. Uh, but uh, what I, the, the commitment that uh, does remain operative uh, is that that's something that we do uh, and in, intend to present to Congress, and when we do, that's something that we'll make public for all of you to consider as well. Okay. I also wanted to get your reaction to um, the drug company Pfizer's announcement that mm -hmm. they've made to buy Ireland-based allergen, which would be the largest, largest tax inversion deal. Mm -hmm. um, Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders said the U.S. should block that deal. Um, is there anything the U.S. government could do to block that transaction? I know that uh, the president has said that he um, does not favor tax inversion deals, but is, is the White House looking at anything it, it might do in this case? Mm -hmm. uh, Julie, I don't have any specific comments on the uh, on any specific private financial transaction, including the one that uh, that you just cited. Uh, there are a couple things, though, that uh, I do think uh, bear mentioning. Uh, the first is just last week the Secretary of the Treasury announced uh, uh, a handful of administrative steps. Uh, that the Treasury Department was taking to try to reduce the incentive and lower the benefit uh, for those countries that are seeking to um, uh, engage in a corporate inversion. Uh, and the second is to remind you of the President's longstanding concern and outright criticism uh, of companies that pursue this strategy that essentially uh, allows them to renounce their citizenship uh, and while continuing to benefit from all that America has to offer. Uh, and whether that is our, um, uh, the, the extraordinarily talented workforce uh, that's in this country, or 
the education system we have in place to ensure that there is a good pipeline of workers that companies can benefit from. Uh, obviously, the United States has uh, uh, large um, customer markets uh, and infrastructure in place that companies uh, benefit from. Uh, and you know, the president said it's not fair uh, for, for companies to essentially renounce their citizenship, uh, seek to, at least on paper, locate themselves uh, somewhere else just so they can pay a lower tax rate. That certainly is not the kind of benefit that's available to middle class families. Uh, and I think the only thing that's worse is that there are Republicans in Congress that continue to protect the ability of corporations to engage in these kinds of actions. Uh, and I guess that's, uh, that's what you get when you have companies that uh, essentially have bought and paid for members of Congress. Uh, it, uh, uh, it may serve the, uh, the corporate bottom line uh, of some of these uh, companies, but certainly doesn't advance the, uh, it certainly doesn't strengthen the economy of the United States, and it certainly doesn't enhance the prospects of middle class families in this country. Okay, Justin. Um, if I can follow on Pfizer a little bit, uh, this would be the largest inversion deal in <coughs> history. And so I'm wondering if this is fresh off the moves that the Treasury Department made last week, but presumably would be unaffected by them. Why, why are those moves effective in any way if the largest drug company in the U.S. can, can go ahead and do the largest pharmaceutical <coughs> deal? Well, for, uh, for the details around the Treasury announcement, I'd refer you to them, and they may be able to explain to you how or whether uh, their announcement would apply to this specific transaction. The, uh, the thing that uh, the Treasury Department for more than a year uh, has been announcing a series of administrative actions uh, to, like I said, reduce the benefit uh, associated with companies um, uh, executing a, uh, an inversion. And we've seen the pace of those inversion announcements slow uh, as a result of the, or at least since that uh, Treasury announcement was uh, first made. Uh, now, you know, I guess whether those two things are connected, I guess, is something that you'd have to dig into. Um, but the pace of these kinds of announcements has slowed since the uh, Treasury Department did begin uh, carrying out these administrative actions to limit the benefit associated with companies doing that. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that all along we have acknowledged that the Treasury Department is rather limited in what they can do administratively and that what w is required uh, is congressional action. And uh, the President's budget has consistently um, laid out a specific proposal for closing this loophole that only benefits corporations and doesn't benefit middle class families. Uh, and we continue to believe that that's something that Congress should act on. Uh, I think just about every Democrat uh, agrees with the President uh, that this should be a priority. Unfortunately, it's Republicans uh, who are blocking any legislative action because they're more interested, it appears at least, uh, in, um, in supporting uh, wealthy corporate interests uh, and not middle class families. Pfizer says the deal would be good for America because it leads, leads to more investment in uh, medical research and keeps 40,000 people invested in, in the U.S. Do you guys agree with that characterization? Well, again, I'm not going to comment on the specific results of a, uh, or the specific consequences of one private financial transaction. What about the sort of antitrust implications or even what the, the effect would be on drug prices? I know that's been uh, something that you guys have talked about. Well, I assume that's something that would be subject to uh, Department of Justice review, but I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not aware of how that process is, uh, is carried out or whether or not even the Department of Justice has publicly said that they prepared to take a look at it. All right, and then one last one um, on something <coughs> Secretary Kerry said last week. Okay. Uh, it was about funding for the contribution to the Global Climate Fund. Um, he said that the President, he was kind of trying to bolster support, reassure allies, and said of the uh, upcoming appropriations process that the President is prepared to veto the budget because it isn't included in it, you can usually find some money. And so I'm wondering, to put a finer point on that, are you guys going to veto any, any budget appropriations that it's been floated would, would slash uh, funding for the State Department that they'd used to make that payment? Well, I, I, I don't have a veto threat to issue from here today on this particular issue. Obviously, this is a priority of the President's. It's included in our budget proposal. Uh, and, you know, we're, con we're certainly going to continue to make the case to Congress that this is something that is, um, that's worth funding. Was Secretary Kerry kind of off the reservation there? I mean, what, what no, I think he's indicating that this is a top priority of the President's. And that's something that, uh, that, that the President has communicated to other world leaders directly. And it's certainly something that will communicate directly to leaders in Congress. Okay. Anita.
Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Vice President's meeting this morning. I mean, I'm assuming it's over with the ambassadors um, of the countries that are um, working to fight the Islamic State. Uh, can you just sort of tell us about that meeting and, and then the purpose, and then I had sort of a follow-up on that. Uh, I haven't gotten a detailed readout uh, since the meeting has concluded, but I can tell you the purpose of the meeting. There were uh, 59 of the 65 uh, uh, countries uh, who are part of our coalition represented at the meeting. They were represented by uh, their, um, represent their ambassadors to the United States. And uh, the conversation focused on uh, how uh, countries who are part of our coalition can ramp up uh, their contributions to our efforts. Now, uh, what's true is that the, uh, the progress that has been made thus far uh, has been a result of the significant contributions uh, that uh, members of our coalition have made. Let me just go through a few of them that the President cited in his news conference. Uh, there are nearly two dozen nations who have made a military contribution to our counter-ISIL campaign. Uh, there are 15 different nations that have deployed personnel in support of uh, training local forces on the ground uh, in Iraq. Uh, and uh, uh, Syrian forces in other countries. Uh, there are uh, 25 nations who are part of the effort that's being coordinated by Germany and the UAE uh, to stabilize areas that have been liberated uh, from ISIL. Um, there is an effort underway to train Iraqi police forces that's being led by the Italians. Uh, and there are 34 different nations around the world that have taken steps to arrest individuals seeking to travel to Iraq and in Syria to take up arms alongside ISIL. Uh, countering the flow of foreign fighters has been a top priority of the President's for uh, more than a year. You recall the President convened a meeting of the, um, uh, at the United Nations General Assembly meeting more than a year ago uh, to talk about uh, how to uh, uh, shut down the flow of foreign fighters and to coordinate the international effort to do so. And we've seen 34 uh, nations respond to that call. There's been an international effort to crack down on ISIL's financing efforts. That's uh, uh, an international effort that's being led by the Saudis. So we certainly appreciate their contribution to that effort. Uh, and we've also talked about how important it is to counter ISIL's uh, messaging online uh, and to make sure that we are mobilizing resources and voices uh, inside the uh, Muslim community uh, to counter uh, ISIL's narratives, uh, ISIL's narrative. And there's a a communication center that was opened at the UA, uh, in the UAE uh, to lead this effort, uh, but we would anticipate that there will be additional centers that will be opened around the world, including in Malaysia, where the President uh, just was. Uh, the last thing that I'll note is that uh, we should not overlook the significant humanitarian effort that's underway to try to meet the basic needs of those millions of Iraqis and uh, Syrians who are fleeing violence in their uh, home countries. Uh, and the international effort to try to uh, meet their basic needs is important. and. Uh, is dependent on, uh, uh, on international coordination uh, and dependent on the leadership of the United States because the United States has actually made uh, the largest contribution to that effort. I just want to be clear, your, your words at the beginning were uh, ramp up. So the United States is trying to convince some of the countries, all of the countries, to ramp up their activities? Well, I guess what I'm trying to do is to lay out for you how critically important the contributions that our countries, that, that countries to this coalition uh, have been. And we believe that there is more that can be done if countries are willing to contribute additional resources. Okay. And then just to follow, do you find, as Russia is sort of looking to form their own coalition, perhaps peeling off members of this coalition, the U.S.-led coalition, do you think that the U.S.-led coalition is eroding in any way? There's zero evidence of that. And what your thoughts on what Russia is doing in terms of trying to form their own coalition? Well, again, I, I, the. I think the President's been pretty blunt about what Russia is doing. Uh, right now what Russia is doing is they are undermining our effort to reach a political settlement. Uh, and they are doing that because they are concerned uh, primarily uh, with propping up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the failed regime of Bashar al-Assad. And that those efforts uh, only undermine our ability uh, to engage the moderate Syrian opposition uh, in a discussion about the long overdue political transition that even Russia acknowledges is needed and long overdue inside of Syria. So uh, we have lo we've also said, and the President said this on a number of occasions as well, that if Russia is prepared to change their strategy uh, and prepared to uh, focus their efforts on ISIL uh, and to work with the international community uh, to do that, then we would welcome them as members of our coalition. Uh, and certainly their efforts 
uh, and the resources that they could bring to bear uh, would be uh, important. Uh, but thus far, they've been unable to do that. They've uh, they focused on another goal, uh, and it is um, not one that has uh, allowed them to build a, uh, a coalition on nearly the scale uh, of what the United States has built. Um, so, you know, the President had an opportunity to discuss this issue directly with uh, President Putin while we were in Turkey last week. Uh, and um, I know this is a conversation that Secretary Kerry has had with his Russian counterpart, Foreign Minister Lavrov, on a number of occasions. And uh, we're going to con continue that conversation, uh, particularly now uh, that, um, um, tragically, that Russia understands the, uh, the stakes for going after ISIL. Okay? Bill. Given everything you've said today and what the President said in this news conference about the support of the coalition and the President's obvious reluctance to commit any U.S. — further U.S. ground troops, what in the world can come of the meeting between him and President Hollande? What's the deliverable, other than expressions of solidarity and support? Well, I don't want to get ahead of the meeting, but I, and I also wouldn't downplay the significance of uh, uh, additional expressions of solidarity and support. This is a time when the French people are grieving, and knowing that, um, that they can count on the uh, most powerful country in the world to have their back uh, as they determine what's necessary to strengthen homeland security in their own country, uh, but also to uh, take the fight to ISIL. I think that uh, will be a source of significant comfort uh, to the French people. Uh, we've also seen the French, just in the last week, uh, announce their willingness to ramp up their contributions. And we did see uh, uh, French military pilots carry out uh, an additional round or two of uh, airstrikes over Syria. Uh, and we certainly welcome that, that contribution. So. Uh, I think there's plenty uh, for the two leaders to talk about, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear from them directly after they have their meeting, and you can get a better sense of what they discussed. You're talking about everybody else ramping up their contributions. You're not talking about the U.S. further ramping up its contributions. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, we've been leading this coalition. Uh, so we formed the coalition. We continue to lead it. Uh, and I think, um, you know, whether you look at the humanitarian assistance that we've provided uh, or the contribution that the United States uh, has made to the ongoing military campaign, uh, our, our contribution uh, has been uh, significant. Uh, and the United States obviously has unique capabilities uh, that we can bring to bear, and we have used them. Uh, let me give you one example. We t I just mentioned the, uh, the French airstrikes that were uh, uh, carried out uh, over Syria last week, and that represented an escalation of their efforts. The airstrikes that they carried out were based on targets that were identified by the United States, based on intelligence that had been conducted by the United States. They were supported by uh, mid-air refueling that was conducted by the United States. Uh, and they were backed by contingency, um, uh, uh, contingency uh, operations, uh, search and rescue capabilities, for example, to ensure that if uh, something went wrong with those flights, that, that those pilots could be rescued. Uh, those search and rescue uh, capabilities were provided by the United States. So I think that is an indication that the United States is certainly um, pulling more than our, uh, uh, than our own weight uh, when it comes to the contribution behind this coalition. But look, that's something that we're glad to do. That is uh, in line with a long tradition uh, of American leadership. It certainly is a, a tradition that this president believes in. Well, that still leaves open the question of what, if anything, can come of this meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, I, I guess uh, what I'm saying is you'll have an opportunity to, to, uh, to talk to the two leaders tomorrow. All right. James. Josh, thank you. Um, First, just to follow up on Julie's question, the President's Defense Secretary, Leon Panetta, appeared on Your World with Neil Cavuto on November 16 and said, and I quote, the President of the United States and other world leaders need to recognize that this is not a time to just kind of sit back and hope that somehow this enemy will go away. The President's other Defense Secretary, Robert Gates, appeared on Your World with Neil Cavuto four days later on November 20 and said, we have all along underestimated ISIS both in terms of how tough it will be to root them out in Syria and Iraq, but also their ability to extend beyond that area to Europe and potentially also to the United States. And then we also have the comments from Dianne Feinstein, quote, on Face the Nation yesterday, I don't think the approach is sufficient to the job. This has gone on too long now and it has not gotten better, it's gotten worse. Do you acknowledge that the criticism of the President about underestimating ISIS about uh, prosecuting the effort uh, with insufficient vigor. 
are coming from people who are not conservatives, Republicans, uh, presidential candidates, or predictable uh, opponents of the president. These are coming from the people who worked with him. Do you acknowledge that? Yeah. Well, I think Mr. Gates would probably describe himself as a conservative Republican. Uh, and I don't know if he was including the president when he was describing uh, the we uh, and the group of people who underestimated ISIL. Uh, I think the uh, coalition mission that I described uh, in terms of the contributions that we're getting from 65 other nations to uh, apply significant pressure to ISIL to carry out uh, more than 8,000 uh, airstrikes against them in Iraq and in Syria, to apply pressure to their leadership, uh, including taking out uh, a range of ISIL leaders, uh, our efforts to constrict their financing, the the wide-ranging integrated effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, I think, is a testament to how seriously the President takes this challenge. You defended the effort. I just want to be clear that you understand that the criticism of this effort is extending beyond the usual precincts, correct? Mm -hmm. To include people that work for this President. Uh, to include people in Washington, D.C., uh, and they're certainly entitled to their opinion. I don't think that either of those individuals uh, would deny the seriousness with which the President has taken this issue, uh, or the complexity uh, of arriving at a solution that is consistent with our national security interests. In his uh, remarks in Kuala Lumpur, President Obama said, and I quote, destroying ISIL is not only a realistic goal, we're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. Am I safe in inferring that, in telling us we're going to get it done, the President was not abandoning his past practice wherein he has always told us that this is going to be an effort that extends beyond his term. He isn't saying when he tells us we're going to get it done that he's going to get it done. He was expressing his resolute confidence that the United States and our 65 coalition partners will succeed in degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. But not before he leaves office. Uh, no, the President was clear that the, uh, the length of time that this is likely to take will, be, will require a substantial commitment, uh, both on the part of the United States but also on the part of the world. Has the United States' participation in the military piece of this, our operational tempo, increased in any discernible way since Paris? Well, uh, the Department of Defense can give you sort of the latest accounting of the, uh, uh, the military operations that have been conducted uh, in Iraq and in Syria over the last week or so. Uh, I would expect that the, for the reasons that I described to Bill, the stepped-up contributions of some of our partners uh, in terms of the strikes that they have taken, probably has required the United States to expend some additional effort to support their uh, strikes. Two more. Uh, the President also said in Kuala Lumpur about the intelligence he has received on ISIS, which as we all know is now under investigation by the Pentagon IG, quote, it's not as if I've been receiving wonderfully rosy glowing portraits of what's been happening in Iraq and Syria over the last year and a half. It feels to me like, at my level at least, We've had a pretty clear-eyed, sober assessment of where we've made real progress and where we have not. Now, I've asked you in this briefing previously uh, if the President has confidence in the intelligence product he's received on ISIS over the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Would I be wrong to construe those remarks from Kuala Lumpur as the President expressing confidence in the intelligence product that he's received over the last year and a half? I, th I think, James, what the President was trying to say, and I want to be careful here because I don't want to get ahead of uh, an ongoing Inspector General investigation. I think the president, what the President was trying to convey uh, is that the uh, intelligence reports that he's received uh, about ISIL uh, and the impact that they've had on Syria and Iraq in particular uh, have been troubling. Uh, and that is part of what has prompted the kind of aggressive and sustained commitment to degrading and ultimately destroying that, uh, that organization that you've seen uh, put forward by the President. Um, that is entirely separate from the question that is currently being uh, investigated by the Inspector General. Uh, but uh, what the President has long said, and what he said again in that news conference, uh, is that he has made quite clear to military leaders and to intelligence officials that he's looking for the best, most accurate assessment of what's actually happening that he can possibly get, because that's only going to improve his ability to make decisions about policy uh, to address uh, the situation on the ground. So as clear as people can be about what's exactly happening, that's what the President wants. And even if that means delivering some bad news, or even if that means providing some evidence to indicate that our previous, previous elements of our strategy didn't work as well as we had hoped, the President would rather get that information uh, and make changes to the strategy where necessary uh, than, um, uh, than not. 
The president tells us that he feels as though he has been receiving clear-eyed intelligence. The Pentagon probe is aimed at determining whether, in fact, he was or not. Should his statement be weighed by the investigators? And in fact, would the president be willing to cooperate personally with this investigation? Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, obviously the president believes in the value and importance of conducting uh, independent investigations like this. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware that the uh, inspector general has sought uh, 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 any sort of presidential cooperation, because I think, frankly, the investigation that they're conducting doesn't rise to the president's level. The, uh, what they're doing is they're trying to take a look at, uh, at least based on published reports, they're trying to take a look at what information, how information worked its way through the bureaucracy at the Department of Defense. Um, uh, they don't seem to be, at least at this point, based on public reports, um, uh, concerned about uh, uh, anything beyond that. Last question. You've been very generous. When the President tells us, in response to just about any question about the progress of the anti-ISIS effort, that his strategy is making some progress amidst setbacks, and that we've always said this is going to take time, and if we get that answer on September 10, 2014, the day after he launched the effort. And if we're getting that same answer in Kuala Lumpur and in Antalya, Turkey, and so forth, uh, if we're going to get the same answer, no matter we're on the second day of the campaign or the 366th sixth day of the campaign, doesn't that, in effect, remove the president from accountability to the American people for how this operation is actually going? Mm -hmm. No, I think the, the president is taking this action because he believes strongly that the national security of the United States and the American people is, is top priority as the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and that's precisely why this uh, operation uh, has, uh, why this strategy has been implemented and why that it's, uh, and the way that it's been carried out. The focus has been on degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. Uh, and we would do that by applying significant military pressure uh, to prevent them from uh, uh, establishing a safe haven inside of Syria and Iraq. Uh, we have taken ISIL leaders off the battlefield. We have regained territory inside of Iraq and in Syria. We have succeeded in shutting off some parts of their financing efforts. So we have made uh, important progress. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I saw that the President's special presidential envoy uh, to uh, the counter-ISIL effort, Brett McGurk, noted uh, that just in the last couple of weeks, more than 1,000 square kilometers in territory has been regained uh, by uh, fighters on the ground from ISIL uh, in Iraq and in Syria. That's an indication of, of some of the progress that's being made. Uh, but the President, uh, you know, as you pointed out from the beginning, has acknowledged that we'll uh, enjoy uh, some periods of success and some, ser some periods of, uh, of progress, and that's part of any sort of ongoing military operation. And that's what we'll continue to hear from him for the next year until he leaves office, correct? Well, progress, we'll, setbacks, it's going to take time, yeah. right? That's I, what we're going to hear? I think what you'll continue to hear from the President is a clear-eyed assessment of uh, his view of, of what's happening. Okay. John. Um, when did the President first learn that intelligence analysts down at CENTCOM were charging that their intelligence reports were being whitewashed to make the situation look better than it really is in Iraq? When did he first learn about that? Well, uh, John, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I'll tell you, I first learned about it when these individuals, uh, when, it, when it became public that these individuals had um, uh, raised their concerns with the Inspector General. Uh, and in some ways, that's uh, you know, the way the process is supposed to work. And, and how concerned is, because I mentioned it's, it's very difficult to make decisions about you know, a military strategy when you can't trust the intelligence you're getting. Mm -hmm. how, how concerned is he about this? Well, I, I think the President certainly is interested in the uh, independent investigation uh, running its course. Uh, but uh, I think the President does. I mean, as the President said yesterday, the President does have a lot of confidence in uh, the individuals who are responsible for uh, presenting intelligence information to him, primarily because he's giving them, given them very specific instruction about his desire to get the best possible sense of what's actually happening on the ground, even if it means uh, coming to the president with some bad news. And uh, the president also acknowledged that there's this area where people might have, that based on the facts that are on the ground, reach differing conclusions uh, based on their own analysis of the situation. That's entirely appropriate. We want people with different points of view to be considering the facts and presenting their uh, analysis to the president. And the, the, there, is, uh, there is a mechanism for ensuring that differing views uh, are incorporated into the intelligence material that's presented to the president. And the president certainly encourages uh, those differing points of view from being represented in the materials that he's presented. Has he noticed a more realistic uh, or pessimistic 
uh, assessment coming from the CIA and other intelligence agencies mm -hmm. than what he's seen come up through the military? Uh, uh, it'd be hard for me to offer that uh, assessment to you, John, just based on, um, uh, you know, based on the, the, the amount of intelligence that I see is much less than the amount of intelligence the President sees. So uh, it's difficult to answer that question. I, uh, I'm not aware that anybody has expressed a tangible change uh, in the intelligence that's being presented to the President of the United States um, uh, that doesn't reflect the kinds of changes that we're actually seeing on the ground. I mean, that's what's uh, that's what's hard about this, is it's hard to sort of control for. Would, would he say that there has been, uh, to a degree, an intelligence failure with the rise of ISIS? I mean, it caught so many people by surprise. It seems to have clearly caught the President by surprise, that the, the, the rapidity with which ISIS swept into Iraq and, 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 and took over this uh, you know, large uh, area. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, John, the, I think the one area where there uh, has been some uh, surprise expressed was in, frankly, the weakness of the Iraqi security forces who were responsible for protecting uh, the nation of Iraq from the ISIL advance. And I think there was surprise expressed uh, that those forces uh, retreated so rapidly in the face of, um, uh, in the face of ISIL fighters, in the face of uh, that ISIL challenge. Um, but you know, for more detailed assessment of what the intelligence looked like prior to ISIL making those significant advances, uh, you probably have to ask somebody in the IC. Can I ask you about something else John Kerry said? Sure. Um, uh, he was uh, uh, commenting on the attacks in Paris and comparing them with the Charlie Hebdo attack, um, saying that uh, there was a sort of particularized focus of perhaps even legitimacy uh, in terms of, well, not legitimacy, but a rationale. You could attach yourself to somehow and say, okay, they're angry because of this and that. Um, what, what do you make of the Secretary of State suggesting, first, that there could have been legitimacy uh, to the attack on Charlie Hebdo, or at the very least, a rationale to mm -hmm. those attacks, uh, and, and, and saying that somehow those were more understandable than, than what happened in, uh, in this latest Paris attack? Yeah. Well, John, in the aftermath, you recall, of, the, of that specific attack, we made quite clear uh, from this podium that there is no justification for an act of violence uh, like, the one, like the attack that we saw carried out by um, uh, against the, um, the editors at, uh, at, at Charlie Hebdo. And I feel confident in telling you that the Secretary of State strongly believes that sentiment. Uh, he certainly doesn't believe there's any justification for the kind of violence we've seen perpetrated by terrorists, uh, either against uh, uh, people at Charlie Hebdo uh, or the kind of uh, um, or, so, or the so citizens he, of France why, in this so most latest incident. So suggesting that there was a legitimacy or a rationale? Well, I think that he, I, I think that uh, he said the word legitimacy and then said that, well, not, and he said, or, uh, not, well, not legitimacy. legitimacy, but rationale. Yeah. Again, I think you have to ask him about that. Okay. April. Josh, um, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you on a couple of different subjects. First, um, I want to ask you about this uh, issue of surveillance of the mosques, and certain mosques in this country that Donald Trump keeps reiterating. He started it before the Paris attacks. What does this White, White House feel about that? Mm -hmm. Well, April, I, I, this may be a source of disappointment to you, uh, but there are times where I've uh, chosen to weigh in to the irresponsible rhetoric that's being spouted by Republican candidates for president uh, and times when I've declined to do so. Uh, I think this is going to be one of those times when I'm going to decline to do it. This is a very serious time when there is a thought process that is seeming to be more vocal in this country about security issues that are trumping the principles of this country. And that's why I'm asking you that question yeah. in all seriousness. And it's not necessarily about Donald Trump, but it's something that he's putting out there and people are listening to it and, and actually embracing it. Well, uh, April, I'll just say that uh, I, I'd encourage you to take a look at the comments that the President made at his uh, news conference in Kuala Lumpur, uh, where he was um, you know, quite clear about the fact that um, you know, language that is used to uh, target or discriminate or specifically alienate uh, Muslims uh, only serves to advance the narrative, the false narrative, uh, that ISIL is trying to write. Uh, and that's why the President believes that the most important thing that the American people can do uh, in the face of uh, these shocking and scary um, images of violence that are being perpetrated by ISIL uh, is to not be afraid 
uh, and to not elevate them uh, to a stature that they don't deserve. Uh, the fact is we shouldn't buy into the fantasy that they're seeking to perpetuate that what they're doing is important. In fact, what we should do is we should actually redouble our efforts to make sure that we're standing up for the values and principles uh, and institutions that we cherish in this country. Uh, that's what, uh, that's the kind of, uh, of response that the President would like to see from the American people. And the truth is, that's exactly the kind of response that we saw from the American people in the aftermath of the Boston bombing from a couple of years ago. We saw the, the people of Boston in the face of a, uh, of a tragic, violent terrorist incident uh, on one of the most uh, special days uh, of the year in Boston. We saw the people of Boston respond with the, in the spirit of Boston Strong, and days later they showed up at Fenway Park uh, for a baseball game to sing the national anthem. And a year later, uh, they had uh, uh, a huge showing to watch another running of the, the Boston Marathon. And that's the, that really captures the spirit and resilience of the American people. And you know, I, seeing the courage that has been on display by those who survived the attack, uh, that's, they are an example of, a powerful example of, of, of the American spirit, and that should serve, frankly, uh, as an inspiration to the American people, even, uh, uh, even in the face of uh, you know, these violent acts that ISIL has perpetrated on uh, another Western city. And along that line, last week I talked to uh, former Virginia Governor Doug Wilder, who was asked about the the fact that security is being pit, pit against the principles of this country when it comes to immigrants and immigration, talking about the refugee issue, the Syrian refugees coming here. And he said that there was an aspect of discrimination uh, as it relates to this controversy over the refugees. Does this White House feel the same about that? Well, certainly there were some individuals who suggested that there should be a religious test imposed on our refugee program, uh, and I think that would be a discriminatory, discriminatory practice that is inconsistent with the values that we have cherished since the forming of this country. Um, so I guess from that standpoint, uh, he's got a point to make. Going back to Donald Trump, um, he basically told uh, someone, uh, an activist for the Black Lives Matter movement, to get out and uh, get out of his rally, and he was roughed up. This White House has had members of grassroots organizations to include members of Black Lives Matter at the table to talk to them about issues going on. Is this now the time where candidates should talk to people, hear what they have to say, or is it the right thing to do to say, get out? Mm -hmm. Well, it, this is uh, not a departure from uh, uh, Mr. Trump's habits. You know, he, he's previously uh, had reporters who were asking him tough questions removed from the room. Uh, so the fact that he uh, might condone uh, violence against a protester is not particularly surprising to me. Um, it's certainly not an approach that I would agree with, but uh, he's running his own campaign, and that's what he should do. Okay. Mark. Yeah, John, back to the all on meeting tomorrow. To what extent is it going to cover, the two leaders going to cover the situation, uh, the security uh, preparations in Paris for the upcoming meeting with all these world leaders mm -hmm. coming in? Or is that a non-issue? Uh, well, uh, anytime you're going to have that many world leaders in one place, security is obviously going to be an issue. Uh, and I don't know how much of the meeting it will take up, but I anticipate that the, secu the ongoing security situation uh, in uh, the French capital will be a, a subject of some discussion, uh, both in the days ahead, but also in terms of the preparation that's underway to host uh, leaders from around the world. And I think the President was quite resolute uh, in his comments yesterday about uh, how important it is for uh, the world to send a clear message that, um, you know, even in the face of this uh, terrible violence, that the, uh, uh, that the business of the, the world and the business of saving the planet is going to move forward. Was there ever any, any consideration given here to the President not going to this meeting? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Joe. Um, more on the whole on. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we sort of assume that um, at least some of this meeting is going to be about Russia. My question to you, just to sort of start off, is does the administration see Hollande here uh, as sort of a mediation between the United States and Russia, especially given the fact that he's going off to meet with Putin afterwards? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think you'd have to talk to President Hollande about what he plans to uh, say to President Putin. The, frankly, what President Obama is interested in doing is showing, I think, in a very visible way, the solidarity that the United States of America feels with our allies in France, uh, even in this uh, very difficult hour for that country. This is a nation that's grieving. Uh, this is a nation that's concerned about the security situation uh, inside their country. Uh, and they can and should take a lot of solace in knowing that the most powerful country in the world has their back uh, and is standing with them in this difficult time. Uh, and that will certainly be an important part of tomorrow's meeting. I think they'll also have some tangible uh, conversations about what steps uh, the United States is prepared to take to uh, help, with, help them with the security situation in their country, you know, particularly when it comes to intelligence sharing. We certainly believe that there is more that uh, France and their European partners can do uh, in terms of sharing information among themselves and with the United States, and we obviously would welcome steps that they would take to do that. We believe that would have um, a positive impact on the security situation, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. Uh, and I would anticipate they'll also discuss uh, how France can continue to ramp up their contribution to our counter-ISIL effort, including uh, in the category of military contributions that France is prepared to make uh, to this effort. What are the tangible steps that Russia would need to do in order to create more uh, cooperation on the issue of ISIS? Mm -hmm. Well, what we've uh, made clear, Joe, is that the Russians need to uh, ensure that they have a military strategy that's consistent with the diplomatic and political objectives that they themselves have identified. Uh, that's been the real problem that Russia has had, both in terms of, their own, of pursuing their own strategy, but also in terms of getting people to go along with it. There's this fundamental contradiction to uh, what they say that their goals are and what they're actually doing on the ground. The fact is, President Putin himself has acknowledged that the terrible problems that are plaguing Syria now, right now, will require uh, a political solution and a political transition. But as long as Russia uh, is engaged in a significant military effort to prop up Bashar al-Assad, that is only going to make it more difficult for that political transition to actually take place. It's going to push that political solution further off into the distance, not bring it closer. Uh, and that's a problem for uh, our 65-member coalition. It's also a problem for Russia. Uh, and that's something that uh, you know, the President's tried to persuade President Putin directly, and I know that uh, uh, other world leaders have tried to do the same. What we'd like to see from Russia uh, is a commitment to the kind of counter-ISIL-focused military effort that our coalition is carrying out. Uh, and particularly if Russia was prepared to integrate those efforts with the broader coalition efforts, uh, then uh, that, would have a, that would have a positive impact, and that's what we would like to see. Is a rollback of economic sanctions over the Ukraine issue completely off the table, or is there a way to sort of incrementally move in that direction to, at the very least, give Olan something <coughs> to take to, to Moscow? Well, the, the, the President Obama and our European partners from the beginning have said that we're prepared to roll back sanctions uh, against Russia once they pursue the and implement the, the Minsk agreement. Uh, and unfortunately, we have seen Russia not take the steps that they have committed to take in the context of the Minsk agreement. That's why those sanctions remain in place. Uh, they shouldn't inhibit our ability to focus on other national security interests. For example, it didn't inhibit our ability to work with Russia to secure the agreement with Iran to prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, but, uh, but I do not envision a scenario in which uh, sanctions relief is offered to Russia in exchange for greater contributions uh, to ISIL, Russia already has a significant incentive uh, to step up their efforts against ISIL. Uh, that's what we'd like to see. And, um, but the, the kind of sanctions relief that we know that Russia would like to get uh, is something that they'll get once they begin keeping their commitments that were made in the context of the Minsk Agreement. Last question. On the vetting process and the refugee programs, mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill, both Democrats and Republicans last week uh, said that the administration had not done the finest job of selling the program, in explaining it to the American public, explaining it on Capitol Hill. Especially so they took a vote on a significant national security issue that they didn't understand? Well, uh, Is that right? Uh, I right. haven't seen anybody say that, but that'd be news. <laughs> well, my, my they didn't question, take time to read the bill? They didn't take that time to understand the program? It's sort of like health care. <laughs> yeah. Well, no? my question to you, though, I haven't heard anybody say that about health care. <laughs> is, right, is, uh, does the administration feel as though it needed to do a better job of, of, of selling the finer points of the vetting process and making people understand it? 
The, uh, I think those who voted uh, for the, um, uh, who voted to further encumber uh, the refugee process um, are accountable for their vote. No. Uh, and I think they'll have to explain, I think they'll have to explain why they voted in that way. I'm sorry, well, the, the, my question to you is the, the program as it stands now, was it not sold well enough? Were the finer points of it not sold well enough to people in Capitol Hill? Well, but again, is that an explanation for why they voted against it? Because they didn't understand what was included in it? Right? That, I mean, that's, that sort of goes to the substance of what you're saying, is that, oh, a bunch of uh, members of Congress voted uh, in a way that, uh, that we obviously disagree with because they didn't understand what they were voting on. Uh, the, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure if that's worse uh, than just voting the wrong way. Uh, or if unwittingly uh, th they voted the wrong way. Here's the, here's the other thing, Joe, that I, that I think probably also uh, is deserving of some attention. There's also a certain uh, level of irony associated with that step, right? We noted that uh, voting to further encumber and bog down the refugee process um, is not likely to do much to improve the national security of the United States. There probably are some reforms to the visa waiver program that we're currently discussing with members of the United States Senate uh, that actually could uh, further enhance our national security. There are a number of steps the Department of Homeland Security has already taken over the last year uh, to uh, strengthen that program, and there may be some additional steps that we could work with Congress to implement that would strengthen that program. But there's one other thing that Congress could do that would actually enhance our national security, and right now that relates to the purchase of firearms. Right now there's not a law on the books that prevents an individual who is already in the United States and that we already know is suspected of having links to terrorism that allows them to go and purchase a weapon. This is particularly ironic because the concerns that were expressed by members of Congress, some members of Congress, was about individuals who are not in the United States uh, and will be subjected to a process of spending two years convincing national security officials that they don't have links to terrorism. They will only enter the United States when they have persuaded those national security professionals sufficiently that they don't have links to terrorism. But instead, members of Congress are prepared to allow those individuals who are already in the United States uh, and are suspected of having links to terrorism from going and, and purchasing a firearm. Uh, and I think that is a pretty clear indication uh, that Republicans in Congress are more interested in playing politics and more scared of the NRA than they are concerned about doing the right thing for our national security. Kelly. Staying on the refugee issue, we have uh, at NBC a new survey that is out that 41 percent of those questioned support the idea of having Syrian refugees admitted to the country. 56 do not. And then if we add that on to the situation on Capitol Hill where there was an overwhelming vote, including 47 Democrats, who wanted to have these additional restrictions on the vetting process. Is the President not hearing where the public is on this issue? Well, uh, Kelly, I, I think we've made a, a pretty strong case about why uh, what Congress did uh, is not going to do much to improve our national security. Uh, it may make, make them feel better uh, in terms of making a political argument, uh, but that's unfortunate when we're talking about an issue as important as our, as our national security. Uh, the fact is the reason that the President continues to support uh, the refugee program uh, is that individuals who enter the United States as a refugee are subjected to more screening and more vetting than anybody else who enters the United States. They have to submit to a background check. They have to submit to an in-person interview. Uh, they have biometric and biographical information that's collected and then run through a, a wide range of databases that are maintained by international criminal organizations or international law enforcement organizations, um, the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community, the Department of, of Defense. Uh, and only then uh, are they given the opportunity to enter the United States. Uh, since 2011, when the, the, when the war in Syria uh, broke out, uh, about 22,000 uh, Syrian individuals uh, were referred to the United States uh, to determine if uh, they could qualify for refugee status and be admitted to the United States. These are individuals, these 22,000 individuals had already been vetted by the United Nations for consideration in this program. Uh, a little more than 2,000 of them have been admitted to the United States. That's an indication of just how rigorous uh, this process is. Uh, and it's why further encumbering that process with, um, uh, with, with even more bureaucracy um, may be um, an effective as a political, a piece of political rhetoric, but it's not going to do anything to improve the national security of the United States. 
Again, if Congress were actually interested in doing that, they'd pass a law that would prevent somebody who's on the terror watch list from being able to buy a gun. That's what Congress could do. And as people are, are sitting around the Thanksgiving table talking about these issues, as they should and as I'm sure they will all across the country, I hope that's a, a, a question that will be raised and asked by members uh, around the table. That if we're going to have a serious discussion in this, in this country about national security, let, let's talk about some pretty obvious things that Congress can do. And one obvious thing that Congress can do is pass a law that prevents somebody for, who's on the terror watch list uh, from, uh, from being able to buy a weapon. That, that, there's no reason. I'm not sure why that's even controversial. I'm not sure why it hasn't been done so far. Uh, I suspect, however, that it has a lot to do with the fear that Republicans have of the NRA. Do you think it's fear on the part of those Democrats, though, who also sided with Republicans in voting that way last, Maybe. Uh, last week? Maybe. It's unfortunate. For tomorrow's meeting, is there any concern that if President Obama does not have some specific, you did mention tangible, but something specific to offer the French president, that when he does then go on to Russia, is it possible that Vladimir Putin will see that as an opportunity to try to outdo President Obama in close proximity? Uh, judging sort of these two meetings almost side by side. Yeah. When you consider the substantial coalition that the United States has built and led and the substantial contribution that we have made to the variety of lines of effort, um, it will require uh, a, a remarkable commitment from Russia uh, to try to match uh, our efforts. But if that's what they want to do, if Russia is prepared to commit the kinds of resources that the United States has uh, in a way that's integrated with the international community to defeating ISIL, We'd welcome that contribution. Look, this, there's no reason this has to be a competition. Uh, we're happy to have their, uh, uh, their contribution be added to the list. Uh, and uh, if it's as sizable as the contribution that the United States has made, uh, we surely would welcome it. OK? Nadia. Two quick questions. Uh, do you have any confirmation that Hassan Soleimani, the head of the Defense Force, was wounded in Aleppo? Do you have any? Information on that. Uh, I've seen spor some sporadic reports uh, about this, but I, I, I'm not able to, uh, uh, to confirm them at all. Okay. Just to follow up on um, April's question, Mr. Trump also didn't rule out that Muslim Americans should carry identification cards and then rule out also that they can be entered into a special database. Considering that the president has many Muslim members serving in his cabinet, and uh, well, in, here, in the administration, and there are many Muslim Americans who are serving in the armed forces and dying for this country. You don't think that you should address them directly, talking in a, uh, to a Muslim Americans? Well, I, I certainly. Uh, well, let me just start, Nadia, by saying that that uh, Mr. Trump and other Republicans on the campaign trail have said a number of outrageous things, uh, and to uh, not criticize them directly for doing so is not to condone that kind of rhetoric. Uh, certainly, I don't. Uh, but I think the President spoke uh, quite eloquently about how important it is for this country to, even in the face of this terrible violence that we saw perpetrated on the people of Paris, that even in the face of those shopping, shocking images, that our response should not be to uh, walk away from our values. In fact, it's a reason to redouble our efforts to fight for our values. And the President is confident that that represents the character of America. And that certainly has been the kind of reaction that we've seen from the vast majority of Americans. Uh, and that is the kind of reaction that represents uh, the way that millions of Americans uh, who are Muslim uh, live their lives. Uh, it certainly is a testament to the values uh, of the American people, uh, including American Muslims. Uh, and. And that's important because, as I mentioned earlier, it undermines the, the narrative that uh, ISIL is seeking to advance. The fact is that there are millions of uh, Muslims in this country who practice their religion freely. And they raise their kids, they send them to the schools, they uh, are able to live the American dream because of the opportunity that they're given in this country. Uh, and Fighting for their continued ability to do that and to not be discriminated against just because of the way they worship God is consistent with the values of this country and important to our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Pam. Uh, 
Josh, with the climate conference coming up, is the president optimistic about getting a, a comprehensive deal that will be significant, verifiable, and really carry through into the future to adequately address climate change? Mm -hmm. Well, Pam, I, the, the president is certainly um, optimistic based on the significant commitments we've already seen. Ninety percent uh, of the countries who uh, emit carbon, or at least uh, I should say that differently. The president's optimistic based on the significant contributions and commitments we've seen that have been made by countries around the world. Uh, these countries um, account for about 90 percent of the carbon that's emitted around the world. Uh, and that represents a substantial um, uh, starting point for uh, negotiations that could yield an important agreement. You know, but ultimately what we want to see is we want to see the kind of agreement that is both ambitious uh, but also verifiable. Uh, and uh, you know, this will, these will be um, discussions in Paris that will take place that I'm sure will have lots of ups and downs and there will be periods over, that, uh, over the course of that 10 or 12 day conference where I'll be standing here answering questions about the talks being, po you know, poised to fail, uh, and uh, those will be fun days. I'm sure they'll, I'm sure you all will enjoy them as much as that I, as much as I will. Um, but I, I think everybody who's participating in the conference understands that the stakes are high. That certainly was true of all of the uh, conversations that the president has had over the last week, uh, with, um, you know, with with leaders of countries large and small, uh, who represent. Uh, or who understand that the time for action is now, uh, and there is an opportunity for the world to do something important uh, to, uh, uh, to fight climate change and to reduce carbon pollution uh, in a way that has positive uh, uh, consequences for the health of our kids uh, and for our economy, because we know that the kinds of investments that the United States has already made uh, in clean and renewable energy uh, are likely to become more valuable uh, as other countries follow through on their commitment to consider alternative sources of energy. And on a different subject, Secretary Kerry said that um, they're looking for ideas, uh, military, counterterrorism, and diplomatic ideas that would um, help defeat ISIS faster. Is that a sign that the President might be willing to change his strategy, or is he referring to other members of the coalition and what they could do? Pam, what we've always said is that the President is prepared to intensify our efforts uh, in those areas where we know our strategy is showing signs of progress. Uh, and you know, whether that is you know, providing additional uh, equipment and reinforcements to those uh, local forces on the ground that are making progress against ISIL, uh, or intensifying our air campaign in the same way that the French have committed uh, to do, uh, or re redoubling our efforts around a uh, diplomatic uh, effort. Uh, these are. Uh, this has always been the way that we have approached this issue, which is to try to uh, intensify uh, our focus on those areas where our, our strategy is showing progress uh, and acknowledge those areas that aren't working as well as we had hoped. Uh, and um, we will have even more confidence in our strategy uh, as more resources are mobilized by our coalition partners. Uh, and uh, that was the subject of extensive discussion in a number of the President's conversations uh, over the last week. Uh, and I'm confident that that will be the case in the weeks ahead. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Olivier. Thanks, Josh. Um, at the UN this year, the President talked about the dangers in leaving a vacuum in a country after removing a, an authoritarian leader, obviously talking about Libya. Um, uh, does uh, this administration currently have a plan for the post-Assad? Well, uh, Olivier, this is actually the subject of, uh, of ongoing discussion that Secretary Kerry has been leading in Vienna over the last several weeks. Uh, what is clear is that uh, President Assad has lost legitimacy to lead that country. Uh, the vast majority of the citizens of that country no longer uh, have confidence in his ability to keep the country together and to lead them in a direction uh, that they support. Uh, a lot of, in large part, that's because the President Assad has used the military of that country to attack his own people. Uh, that certainly would be uh, uh, one uh, one way to undermine confidence in your leadership. Uh, and. That's why the President has been pretty blunt about the fact that it's not just uh, that his actions, that President Assad's actions are morally repugnant, uh, he's attacked uh, innocent civilians, but it's also that he's, as a practical matter, he's lost the support of the people, and so he can't lead that country. Uh, and so the nature of the ongoing discussions uh, in Vienna 
uh, over the last several weeks has been to figure out how to put in place uh, the uh, milestones for a political transition. And uh, you know, what they have essentially said is that um, you know, the countries with a stake in this have essentially agreed to support uh, a strategy that would bring parties together no later than January 1st to begin those discussions. That would also, um, what would also take place simultaneously is a, uh, is a ceasefire. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully that would lay the groundwork for, uh, for negotiations and eventually uh, a vote. And uh, look, the President has acknowledged, and we've said this many occasions, and I don't know if I've said it yet today, the United States, despite our significant military commitment, will not succeed in imposing a military solution on the situation in Syria. No matter how substantial the military contributions are from the United States and our coalition partners, it's not a military solution that's going to succeed here. It's a diplomatic and political one. Uh, our military strategy is predicated on taking out ISIL leaders uh, and preventing them from establishing a safe haven. Uh, but if we're going to uh, address the root cause of the problems inside of Syria, it's going to require a political transition. Uh, and that's difficult work when you consider all of the uh, different interests that are at stake here. Uh, that's why there are some 20-odd, 22 countries that are around the negotiating table, including countries with rather di uh, diverse interests, like Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, but yet it's because the leadership of the United States and Secretary Kerry deserves a lot of credit for this, that we succeeded in getting everybody in the same room to begin having those, these conversations. And it's because despite their differing opinions uh, and their differing levels of commitment uh, to that country, all of them acknowledge that a political transition is necessary to address a, uh, uh, a situation that has had negative consequences for all of the countries involved. And then, uh, the American envoy to the, uh, the OPCW, the organization in charge of overseeing the, uh, the destruction of, of chemical weapons, the U American envoy today said that the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian conflict is, quote, becoming routine. Um, how does the president's strategy uh, handle that, handle this apparently routine use of chemical weapons? And do you know, um, and can you say, whether these are Assad caches that were missed a couple of years ago or whether these, this is new production? Mm -hmm. uh, Olivia, I have to, uh, I didn't see the comments uh, of our OPCW representative, so I may uh, have to get back to you on this thing. I mean, I think the one thing that is true is that there were, um, I believe, hundreds of tons of chemical weapons that were uh, in uh, President Assad's stockpile that were effectively identified, removed, and destroyed uh, by the United States working closely with Russia. Uh, and um, that was a significant uh, accomplishment because we know that had those materials not been removed and destroyed, uh, the risk associated with chemical weapons would be even greater uh, inside of Syria. Uh, but uh, for the response to the specific comments that have been shared, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Okay, Victoria, I'll give you the last one, then we're going to call it a day. Um, the Syrian rebels are not at the table for these talks, and they are saying, look, he's a war criminal, he needs to be in jail, you all can have as many talks as you want, but that's our position, and that's, that's where we're dealing from. So how far can these talks realistically go as long as they're not involved? Well, Victoria, the, the goal of these conversations is for the countries uh, in the region and around the world who have an interest in resolving the situation inside of Syria, agreeing to an approach that would eventually include uh, bringing the uh, opposition together. The thing that's important for you to understand is that the opposition is far from monolithic. There are a variety of different uh, uh, organizations and groups that are involved that presumably would like to have uh, some kind of say in the future of Syria. So this is a, this is a complex process. Uh, and getting them to participate in that process and getting them around the negotiating table uh, is only a first step. So uh, I would acknowledge that, uh, uh, that we're a long way from the kind of political solution that's uh, long overdue but necessary. Uh, but there's no denying that if you can get uh, uh, countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Russia uh, around the table discussing this and coming to at least the broad outlines of a framework for pursuing this kind of political transition, that that's a significant development. Uh, but there's a, there's a long way to go, and certainly resolving or at least addressing uh, the wide variety of concerns that are sure to be um, uh, aired by uh, opposition groups once they get in the room 
uh, that will sort of be the next, uh, the next challenge that we'll face here. And, and the talks tomorrow, is there a difference between President Obama and President Hollande on the time frame for the removal of Assad? It seems that Hollande may be more pragmatic as to when Assad needs to go. I sense more urgency from you. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I, maybe you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to hear more directly from President Hollande about his views on this. I think you know, we've been quite clear that uh, this political transition uh, is going to need to end with uh, President Assad leaving power. And again, that's not just because we've got um, significant moral concerns about the way that he's led that country, and by, basically, more specifically, by the way that he's attacked innocent civilians in that country. But just as a practical matter, he's not able to lead the country. The vast majority of the citizens of that country don't support him and have been the victims, uh, have been victims of his attacks. So we're going to need to see a, a political transition in place to resolve the, uh, the political problems that are plaguing that country. Uh, and I think, look, uh, despite our, the wide variety of opinions that are represented in, those, uh, in that room in, in Vienna, I think everybody's come to terms with that fact. Okay? Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a good Monday. We are, uh, the President will be doing a news conference with President Hollande uh, tomorrow after their bilateral meeting. That'll be in the late morning tomorrow, last I heard. Uh, we will not do a briefing on Wednesday, so I wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Okay? Thanks, guys. Are you turkey? Counting on it. Thank you.